Can we stand as the family comes in? Just before I welcome everybody, I'm going to ask our senior pastor, Pastor Richard, just to open in prayer for us. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to Word of Faith. Um, I wish it would be under better circumstances, but here we are. Let's open in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for the life um, of Mr. Miller. And I pray, Father God, that you will bless it the family. I pray, Father God, that your presence will be here in this room. And I pray, Father, that your comforting Holy Spirit will touch each of us. I I speak peace over this congregation. And I pray, Father, for healing for the family, friends, and loved ones. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As Pastor Richard said, please be welcomed. And yes, friends and family, we are gathered under, together to pay respects to a real great man, Gary Craig Muller, who I got to know in the last couple of years through Justin and Tess and their family, and um, as well as Boom, uh, Corin, his wife, I've got to know recently. And to this afternoon, we're going to have a time where we're going to really just bring to remembrance all the good things. Because at the end of the day, we don't have Uncle Gary with us anymore, but we have the memories. It was quite remarkable while the photos were streaming through that there was probably 2 or 3% of those photos where he didn't have a smile. Even while laying in, the hosp- in a hospital bed, he had a smile on his face. And I knew him as, uh, uh, that, that way. In fact, I found out that he was a kinsman the other day when, on Sunday when I went to see um, Corin and Justin. Apparently, he was quite a prankster. <laughs> and I love playing pranks on people, but that's the way Uncle Gary was. And so this afternoon, I'm going to share a little message that I really feel was the message that I need to share this afternoon. And then we're gonna have a a few tributes from the family and from, um, as well as a special item from Uncle Gary's grandson, Josh Muller. But as we do so, I'm gonna just direct you quickly to a, a word that I felt I needed to share with you guys this afternoon. You know, this time of the year, we receive lots of invitations. At the end of the year, there's graduation parties, there's year-end functions, there's so many things that happen. We, we, there's dinners, there's little parties, there's sporting events, end of the year sporting events. As we wrap up the year, the, all these invitations come. And so we become very used to, and we become accustomed to getting invitations. But while I was thinking about Uncle Gary, and I I thought of one of probably the greatest invitations that were ever made. It was made by Jesus Christ in Matthew 11, verse 28. And it says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's quite an awesome, filled power-packed invitation when you understand the, the benefits of accepting this invitation. There are times in our lives, especially in, in this kind of a situation where we need, where we have a higher sense of the need for rest. And I'm sure as the family and the friends um, commemorate and bring to remembrance all the good and wholesome relationships and wholesome events and wholesome interactions they had with Uncle Gary, then, you know, as you think through and ponder through that, you think about how you're going to miss him. And it does 
bring about a heightened and a, and a new sense that I need rest from this heaviness. And, and the, 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 the message that I want to leave with everyone today is come unto me, all who are labor, who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. We may sometimes feel like the whole world is caving in on us. Whether it's because of loss of family people, family members, or whatever other consequences as a result of somebody passing on, it feels like the world's caving in on you. You don't know where else to turn. Jesus is inviting us this afternoon to come unto him. And he says, I will give you rest. There are two types of rest that I really want to just share as, a, as an encouragement to you guys as a way out because there's nothing in life that forces you to think more about life than a time of death. Death comes and shakes us up and causes us to think about when will my last breath be? Death comes to cause you to just take, take um, uh, um, stock of your life. Death comes and makes you ask the questions, am I happy? Am I fulfilled? Death comes and causes you to think about, am I in re right relationships with those around me? Whether it's your parents, your brothers and sisters. But death comes and wakes us up to life sometimes. And the reality is, with Uncle Gary's passing, I'm sure lots of deep pondering thoughts have been going through everybody's minds. Maybe a, th a time where you forgot to say something or pass something to him or do something and now that he's no longer, you're thinking, I should have, I should have, I should have. And death really brings about awakening to life. There's two things I want to talk about this afternoon in terms of what we can get rest from. And as I said, you know, death brings us to a place where we're more aware of life. And the two things I want to speak about is rest from sin and rest from sorrow. Each and every one of us have sinned. I think sometimes we have notions and understandings absolutely incorrect how, however they may be, but we have notions and understandings of who's good people and who's bad people. And you know, the Bible even says that one day when we get to heaven, we'll be shocked at who will be there. So I want to say this afternoon, each and every one of us have sinned. Each and every one of us have failed Almighty God. Most of us may not be murderers or bank robbers, but some of us have, become, have been unreasonably angry sometimes at loved ones. Some of us have been disobedient. Some of us have carried bad attitudes. Some of us have not done things that we ought to have done. And some of us have done things that we ought not to have done. We have all fallen short of the grace of God. We are all sinners. That guilt of sin can sometimes be quite a labor intensive space. Jesus is saying he's here to relieve you from the burden of sin. He came, he died for us, and he rose from the dead with all glory. So rest for your sin is paid for. And as you ponder through some things, even thinking about Uncle Gary's life and his death, as you ponder through those things, just release them. Understand a way has been made for you already. And then the second thing that I really felt I needed to share about in terms of what we need to have rest from is the rest from sorrow. Now, there's many sorrows in the world, death being one of them. Many sorrows in the world, death being one of them. However, the Lord Jesus Christ says to us, and I'm saying it again, come unto me, all who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. You need to bring your sorrow to the Lord. 
The Bible says it this way. I'm going to say to the family. In Matthew, the Bible says, Blessed, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So there is rest for your sorrow as you mourn. It's not the end of the world. It's not a, a weight that you cannot carry. It's a strength that is ready and available to you if you just tap into it. So, find rest from Jesus for sin. Find rest from him for your sorrows. Come and pour out your heart to him and find peace. John 14 verse 27 says this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not, let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, will guard, you, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the last one is 1 Peter 5 verse 7, which says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Muller family, I want to say to you this afternoon, there's rest from your sorrow. And the scripture says, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. We're going to go into some tributes from the family. I'm going to ask Rusty, and Rusty Muller in the meantime to come up. Followed, following Rusty would be, will be Vivian Butler and then Justin Muller after that. Every Sunday when, is it on? There we go. Every Sunday when I go to church, I, I sit in the front row uh, for two reasons. One, um, no one else ever sits there, so my place is always there. And number two, I, I'm forced to stay awake. So I'm, I'm just worried a little bit that you're so far back that you're going to fall asleep while I'm busy talking. So let's see what happens. So I'm going to share a few um, light-hearted moments about the character of Gary. Uh, in case you don't know who I am, I'm Gary's brother, Rusty, and I'm here to represent the family. So I also want to uh, just say thank you f to everybody for coming along. Really appreciate the fact that you are here for you. Three words. Camaraderie, compassion, courage. I want you to think about that while I'm talking. So now those of you that know Gary will have known that... Um, Right from an early age, he was a guy that loved mechanical things, technical things. He, he liked to see how things work. Uh, he was always taking things apart and trying to see the intricacies of, of how things work. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples, light-hearted examples of um, what Gary did in the early years. So when we were young, we were living in Queenstown. Um, our family was a family of five boys, quite hectic, you can imagine, all two years apart. Gary was the middle child, um, and I remember my mother uh, used to have this lady that used to come and visit us every Tuesday afternoon, and she used to come and have tea with my mom. Now, in those days, it was all about tea. It wasn't about coffee. And uh, she had an old Morris that she parked in our driveway. And after I don't know how many cups of tea, an hour or so later, two hours later, she came out um, to on her way to get to a car, and Gary was sitting at the back wheel with a hammer in his hand. And then when Auntie Mary got to the car, she noticed that all four tires, not one, all four tires had been punctured. He had knocked a nail into every single tire because he wanted to work out how this noise came out of this tire. And when Auntie Mary went uh, and got the mechanic, the mechanic came back and he, he found it very difficult to believe that a four-year-old boy could not not only knock one nail into a tire, but he could do it to all four tires. That was typical of Gary. 
Then another time, I can remember we were a little bit older. Um, I'd just come out of the army. I'd just got my license. And um, my dad bought a, a type of beach buggy, an old Volkswagen, really, with the doors cut off. So there were no doors, and there the back part where there would have been doors on a normal car, that was also cut off. And there were two like bars in there, welded in there, so that when you were in there, you didn't fall out. And it had some canvas things on the side that you could clip on if it started to rain. So Gary was tasked with getting this vehicle going. So he brought it into the garage, took all the wheels off, and I can't remember how long he spent working on that vehicle. But I can remember that um, it was a weekend, and um, I had about four or five of my friends come to say hello, and Gary had four or five of his friends come and say hello. And Gary came out the garage and he said, listen, the vehicle's ready, we must take it for a spin. So of course we all went in there, Gary was at the back putting tires on the back, my friends and myself and his friends were putting the tires on the front, reversed the thing out of the garage, up Maitland Road, which is now the main road to Bishu. It was much quieter in those days. Took a spin up the road, made a U-turn, came down the road. Now you must know there are five or six of us in this little vehicle. And we'd, I'd no sooner got the vehicle into fourth and I just felt this coop and I looked like this. And there went the back wheel rolling past me down Maitland Hill and then I heard the other one coof and the other one went off as well. So there we were, I was a newly qualified uh, driver and I had a vehicle with no wheels in the back and one of them was about 300 meters down the road. And of course Gary, being with his friends and everybody, you know what he was like, he blamed everyone else, and, uh, but it was quite a good story to tell. And then I'll just tell you one more about um, those days. My parents bought a house, um, well the family bought a house at Hamburg, um, which is just the side of East London. And uh, for about 10 years, we organized a fishing competition there. And we called it the Hamburg Classic. And I invited four or five of my mates and Gary invited a few of his friends as well. And it wasn't long before Gary had sort of separated us into, I had a couple of teacher friends, I'm an ex-teacher, uh, teacher friends there, and my cousin was there. Um, and Gary had some of his mates that were there as well. And uh, he, he called us the intellectuals, and they were the blue-collar workers. Anyway, one night we were having a bra and having a beer there, sitting on the veranda, and Gary came out with a couple of packets of peanuts in his hands, four or five packets of peanuts. Opened the packet, and he gave one to me. He said, Russ, there's one for you, and he took a couple of peanuts out, and he opened another one. He gave it to my cousin Swen, and he gave it to Peter Roger, and I can't remember who else was there. Anyway, we guzzled them down because we were all hungry waiting for a bra. Well, I want to tell you something. About three hours later, I had this burning sensation in my stomach. And uh, I eventually, I was forced to go to the toilet. And by the time I was there, the third time, I just heard this knock on the door. Rusty, get out, get out, get out. I need to get in here. I need to get in here. Alan, I rushed out. And the next thing, uh, my cousin went in. And after him, Peter Roger was there. And he was knocking. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we were up all night. And, and Gary said, oh, it must have been those muscles that you guys had. We didn't have any of them. They must have been off. Anyway, it took us a whole year until the next uh, Hamburg, Hamburg Classic that Gary actually told us what he did. So I don't know if you, any of you know what a terracotta bean is, but it's a little bean that looks like a peanut. And he'd put one into each of our packets of peanuts. And of course, we guzzled them down. And then we found out what these terracotta beans are used for. They are used by vets to make a cow's stomach work. And, and we had one of them. A cow weighs 800 kilos, we weigh less than 100. And so that was Gary. Um, he was always up to mischief and, um, and he loved life. Uh, the second characteristic I want to share with you about Gary is about compassion. Um, now, I'm, I know all of you that are here, you, you obviously know Gary. Um, but he was one of the kindest guys that I know. He was always willing to help. Um, and I can go back to another story. When he was still living in East London, he, he um, belonged to a ski boat club called uh, Christmas Rock, which is between East London and PE, just outside of East London. And Gary was so kind, he, he, he got these guys that, to fish with him, and they didn't have transport, so Gary arranged for them to meet, meet him at the airport on his way out. And then he would pick them up, and they would go to Christmas Rock, fish for the day, and come back. But the problem with that was that in those days there were no cell phones. Um, and so when Gary woke up on a Saturday or a Sunday morning, depending on which day they were going to go out, um, he, he would decide whether it was, the weather was a little bit bad or maybe it had a 
party the night before and, and he, you know, he wasn't going to go fishing. And the sad part about that was that those fishermen that used to wait for him there at the airport and, and my brother Clive, who, who lives in Hamburg and goes through to East London every day, he tells me now that when he goes past the airport, there's some old gray-headed guys there standing there with fishing rods and he wonders if these guys are still waiting for Gary. <clears throat> And I can remember talking about his compassion. I can remember how many times, and you guys, who, who I see all these ski boat fishermen here would know this, how many times Gary helped guys when he was, you know, Gary loved the sea. He loved being on the sea, at the sea, and in the sea. Um, and how many times he helped people out there when their motors were broken, or they'd run out of petrol. And sometimes he would even travel four or five kilos on his boat to give a guy bait who would run out of bait and so on. Um, and... I can also remember back more recently to when we had the last flood. He phoned me the one day when we were having this flood and he said to me, Rusty, he said, bring your landy and we'll take our two landies and let's go and see where we can help people. That was the kind of guy he was. And we rode around town, uh, especially in the Greenshields Park area where it was flooded, and we rode around helping guys, pulling them out of mud, pulling them out of the garden, the drivers and everything were filled with water, cars had cut out and all that. But for Gary, he, he, that is the kind of person that he was. He was so passionate about things like that. And if I think back to the amount of times that Gary has fixed, in my own uh, personal capacity as well, fixed lawnmowers, weed eaters, motors, um, you name it, uh, wash machines, scooters, he's, he's fixed them for everybody. And, and most times, never at any cost. And it's only been recently, and I see my friend Slobby's here, um, only up until fairly recently when Slobby's been giving Gary a bit of business so he can make some income, um, has, he been getting, has he ever got any income out of it? He always did it for himself. People fished on his boat. They never paid. They used his fishing kit. They, they um, used his bait. And even when they went home in the evening, he didn't just give them one fish. He gave them a whole handful of fish. And I'm sure some of these noted guys will remember now as well. He was part of a group that um, used to fund... Uh, children who stayed in the bush around, uh, around um, Newtuk Ski Boat Club. He funded them, they funded them, um, their school fees, their matric dances, fundraising and all that kind of thing without any, without any seeking any kind of glory. That was the kind of guy that, that Gary was. And then one last story about uh, compassion. I, I can remember when my, my baby brother Ashley um, used to live in some masonettes um, in Westring. And Gary went to visit Ashley one day. And next door to Ashley was a colored guy there who was disabled. And he was battling to get around on his crutches and all that. Two days later, there was Gary. He'd bought a 4,000 rand wheelchair and he just dropped it off for the guy. No, thank, he didn't ask for any thanks, didn't tell anybody about it. But that was the kind of guy that Gary was. So let me go on to the third word that I mentioned, courage. So now I can tell you many stories about um, how positively he, he showed determination, how um, brave he was, and how he just showed plain old guts for lots of things. But I would like to just tell you a little story. When I was still teaching, um, we used to have the blood bank used to come to our school to come and try and motivate parents to, to donate blood. And um, I said to Gary, I said, Gary, I want you to come to school with me. I was a deputy principal there, and I was, I was gonna do assembly that morning. And so I'd worked out a theme to do with blood. And I got my brother on the stage, just the two of us, I was standing there talking like I am now, and he was sitting there on the stage. And I proceeded to tell them some of Gary's history, how he fell off the ladder and he shattered his pelvis, uh, he got the colon cancer, all the stuff that went with uh, the colon cancer, how he, the, the radium for the colon cancer made his, um, his colon and that start bleeding in different spots. I mentioned to the children how over the course of 33 months, I'm talking about back then, not recently, 33 months, Gary went to, sorry, uh, 14 months, Gary went to hospital 33 times, and in that time, he re received at that particular point something like 140 units of blood. So, of course, when I took him off the stage, Mareka, the person who was representing the blood people, stopped me at the end of the steps because I was going to walk Gary out, and she said to me, Rusty, please, won't you ask Gary to please stay? Because now she was going to get up and and motivate the children to motivate their parents to donate blood. And, um, and as that worked out, uh, Mareka from the blood department 
had a, a perfect candidate for her to motivate people donating blood, and it was about, it was about a week later that um, Gary was on Radio Algoa, and they asked him all about his stuff and all that. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a good example of someone that had received blood and was surviving. Um, and, you know, the thing about his illness was that he never, he never complained. Uh, I, Boom probably had a lot of it, but to us, his family and all the outsiders, he never complained. He always had faith in his doctors, and whenever you asked him how he was, he used to say he was fine. Um, I can remember him coming home, and you'd look at him, and, you, and he'd be working in the garden, and you'd think, but gee, he doesn't look well, eh? And you ask him how he is, no, no, he's fine. I can remember, Boom can tell us... Um, how many times he came back from hospital after being there three or four days, and within half an hour, he was out there mowing the lawn. And that's the kind of courage that he used to show. He, he didn't, and he used to tell Boom, uh, stop babying me. Stop making me like a baby. Just let, leave me, you know. So he showed so much courage when it came to that. Um, so two things have stood out for us as brothers with regard to Gary's fight against his illness. Number one, the support he got from his family during those stressful times. And yeah, I must say a special thanks to Justin, um, who was always there in the background, in the foreground, just supporting, helping, advising. And I think you did a great job as a, as a son. Um, I know your brothers are overseas, so it would have been very difficult to them. And then I also want to just say thank you to Vivian. After last week, Vivian, uh, you took control of everything. You found everybody. You did all the arrangements, and it reminded me that you were a soldier and a very good one, and you did that very, just like a soldier would, in an orderly and controlled manner. And then, Wimpy, the Muller boys want to say a special thanks to you for the unselfish way you went about looking after Gary. You have no idea how grateful we are that we knew we could rely on you. The stress you must have been under, the sacrifices that you have made, the dread you must have experienced every time Gary was carried away in an ambulance, you seeing his health deteriorate like it did. But you loved him without restrictions. And you can be proud of the way you looked after him. And I'm starting to get a little bit emotional now, but I must tell you, someone told me that if you're starting to feel emotional, just close your eyes for a moment, which I'm doing, and then think of Cheslin Colby going inside Owen Farrell at the World Cup, and then that will stop you from thinking about that. <laughs> that was point one. The last point, point two, Gary's Christian faith. Gary knew that his uh, battle with his illness and the courage he showed would never have been possible without his heavenly father. Gary had long ago made peace with the blow he was dealt. He had long ago accepted his circumstances. And... He had a motto, which I saw carved out on the inside of his cupboard the other day, onward Christian soldiers, onward Christian soldiers. And so to end off, I would just like to say, we as a family, we take comfort from the fact that Gary is at peace. He's at peace. His suffering is over. And right now, he's sitting on the right hand side of our heavenly father. He has reunited with his mom and his dad and Stu. And for that, we salute him. The king of camaraderie, the king of compassion, the king of courage. We salute you, Gary. Hamba Kuchle. We rest in peace, my brother. Thank you. Wow, that was an awesome tribute. Thank you, Rusty. I'm going to ask Vivian to come up. He's going to do a tribute on behalf of Nortuk Ski Boat Club. Good afternoon, everybody. Gary's uh, Nordic fraternity asked me to just give a tribute here. In loving memory of Gary Miller, a tribute to a remarkable member. It is with heavy hearts that we share the sad news of the passing of our esteemed honorary member, Gary Miller. Gary was not just a member of our club. He was a cherished friend, a dedicated family man, and an exceptional, exceptional fisherman. His presence and contributions to our community will be profoundly missed. Our deepest condolences go out to the Muller family during this difficult time. Losing a husband, father and friend in an is an irre irreplaceable loss and we want you to know that our thoughts and prayers are with you. Gary's passion for fishing was truly unmatched. The memories of his exploit on the boat Grand Cru will forever be etched in our hearts. He had a remarkable ability to surprise everyone with his excellent catches, making each trip a memorable experience for all who had the privilege of sharing the waters with him. 
Gary's knowledge of the sea, whether navigating on a ski boat or yacht, was truly impressive. He was always willing to share his expertise and experience with others, enriching the lives of those around him. His dedication to the club was further exemplified by his years of service on the committee as, a fisherman's, rep as the fisherman's representative. In recognition of his outstanding contributions, Gary was awarded honorary membership, a testament to the lasting impact he had on our community. His legacy will continue to live on in the story shared, the lessons taught, and the friendships forged during this time with us. As we bid farewell to a dear friend and a true icon of our club, let us remember Gary with fondness and gratitude for the joy, camaraderie, and wisdom he brought into our lives. May he rest in peace, and may his family find solace in the cherished memories they shared with him. We will miss you, Gary. Rutex Keyboard Club. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, I'm going to ask Justin to come up. Justin's going to do a tribute on behalf of him and his brothers. And I must say, listening to Rusty and to Vivian, I don't know Stuart and Dylan that well. I know Justin very well. And when they were both speaking, I thought, are we speaking about Gary or are we speaking about Justin? <laughs> <laughs> um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Gary's oldest son. Uh, if you're wondering, what, I'm just going to read this thing. Sorry. Um, if you're wondering why my brothers are not here, um, my dad made it very clear that, I'm, that they are not to come to his funeral um, when the time eventually came, not because he didn't want them here, but because he knew the sacrifice it would be and the heartache it would cause, and he didn't want, um, <coughs> and he didn't want to um, put them through that. So uh, Stu and Dill, they're watching online. Um, hello. <laughs> um, we're going to celebrate my dad's life when they come to South Africa next month, when we'll take him out to see one last time. Um, I'm going to read a letter from Stuart. Uh, Stuart's the middle brother. He's in Canada, in Lacombe. Um, and he's asked me to read this letter for him. It says, there are many words I could use to describe my father. He had a great sense of humor. He was kind beyond measure and sometimes had an irrational, positive attitude. <clears throat> he taught me many things, but of all the things I've learned from him, I think the ability to solve a problem might have been at the top of the list. He led by example in this regard. No challenge was ever too big. No problem was ever too difficult. He had the ability to look at a situation from the outside and find his own understanding. He was never afraid to try, and he taught me and my brothers to think like this. My dad was supportive. He always encouraged me to follow my heart. Go for it, boy, was the words I'll never forget etched in my memory. Moments like these have a way of putting life into perspective. You really don't know what you've got until it's gone. Dad, you are going to be missed more than words can ever explain. Your kindness, your positive attitude towards life are inspiration. I'll strive to live up to it until we meet again. I love you. Um, that was from Stuart. Um, now for me. <laughs> I really tried to prepare myself for this day. Um, I've got 
going to read this. <laughs> I really tried to prepare myself for this day, but nothing could have prepared me for how I feel today. I was fully aware of my dad's health issues and that there was always a real probability of him dying. But over and over, he proved everybody wrong. We eventually re jokingly referred to him as die hard. He often said the Lord must have kept him here for a reason. Without going into too many details, my dad has been shot at, robbed by knife point, and by a brick to his head point. He fell over three-story scaffolding, shattered his pelvis, he had to learn to walk again after being in a wheelchair for almost a year. He beat cancer, and he recovered from open heart surgery. You live there. <laughs> Thank you, Dad, for staying with us for as long as you did. You literally fought for your life for as long as you could. You fought until you couldn't fight anymore. Now you can rest and you don't need to fight anymore. Thank you for the years of love and support Thank you for sticking around for your grandchildren, Josh and Lizzie, so that they could know what it's like to have a grandpa and build fond, fond memories for you. I thank God for the extra time he gave you with us. Growing up without you in the house was difficult, but you were still a good father, despite the circumstances. You taught me how to fish, you taught me how to drive, even though it was at age 11. You taught me how to stand up for myself. You taught me how to be brave. You taught me that I don't need to be afraid of anything. And even if I am afraid to just do it anyway, like I'm doing now. <laughs> you taught me to say yes to opportunities and to figure out the how later. You taught me to take risks. I don't think I would have ever left my stable job to start a business if I hadn't seen you do it first. I knew I could come to you when I didn't know what to do, even when, even if I knew you couldn't help, just knowing that you were there was just enough. When life got overwhelming, I could just come and visit and bounce things off you. You would always put things into perspective. You would say, Pressure is something that you put in a tire. So <laughs> what is pressure really? We often just stress about things that's not even there yet. And we, so, so you taught me how to step back and see things from a zoomed out perspective. Dad, I will miss you. I'll miss not having you around. I'll miss the comfort of your voice until we see each other again. Um, to Auntie Boom, to Corin, I want to say a special thank you to you for sticking by my dad's side, for putting up with his stubbornness. There's so many good memories that I have with you and my dad. <laughs> Sorry, my notes, but do you remember when we used to watch movie, <laughs> rent a video machine <laughs> and hire like seven movies for the weekend? and lie in, the, lie in the lounge. Um, you, stu you stood by my dad in sickness and in health and in the good times and in the bad times. Life is going to be different now. We both have a big hole in our hearts. No more late nights in the emergency room together. No more paramedics. In the middle of the night. Really done. <laughs> Are you still my other mother and Josh and Lizzie's other granny and will always be there for you when you need us? 
thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for him. And that's me. And now we're going to watch a video from Dylan, the youngest son. Hello, my name is Dylan. I am Gary's youngest son. And I have prepared something which highlights my experiences with my dad. Gary made my life. Gas, pops, foot. Captain, China, dad. You will be greatly missed. I knew you all of my life and almost half of yours. The impression you imparted on me will be carried for the rest of my days. You are my father, and as I matured, that relationship developed into a friendship. And what a friendship indeed. You are my lifelong teacher, cheerleader, and wisdom dispenser. A bond really kicked off when I was about 11 years old. This was when you started teaching me how to use tools and for some reason entrusted me with an angle grinder. We bonded over technical topics which you explained by always creating metaphors based on my current interests. We fixed bicycles, scooters, cars and everything else. We even rebuilt Captain Rev's engine, that's Justin, after the valves started clapping for themselves while drag racing his friends on Marine Drive one Saturday night. You were constantly kind. This needs no elaboration. Everybody in this room knows this of you. You donated hundreds of units of blood, although you did take most of those back in your final years. A side note for anyone here capable of donating blood is to please do so. I wish that I could personally thank every one of those donors that gave a little bit of themselves to keep my dad's body chugging along. You were the go-to guy for many things. You provided a sense of calm and safety, no matter the situation. You provided the leadership and problem solving that was needed for the occasion. No job was too big or too intimidating. A journey of a thousand miles is accomplished one step at a time. You knew how to have fun. You knew how to play practical jokes. You knew how to give your friends the jippo guts of a lifetime by using some magic bean you got from a herbalist on Governor Becky Street. You liked Buddha music, hoing that lang adem water pump with your beloved Karen. You liked blues. But most of all, your favorite artist was my brother Stu. You were a proud dad, and that brings me great comfort. Some of my favorite memories together are watching stock car racing, going for buffoing, fishing, and hanging out in the garage. We spent a lot of time in the garage, and I think that was my favorite. You taught me to fish, how to drive a boat, a forklift, a car, and even how to drive a Land Rover smoothly. You taught me to believe in myself. On my 21st birthday, you wrote me a poem, two of my favorite lines, and most lived by lines follow. If you can dream it, believe it, then you can achieve it. There will always be a mountain in front of you. Climb it. The view is better from the top. You taught me about courage and confidence. My mom doesn't know this story and I don't condone this behavior. It is a very fond memory though. After work one day, an enraged taxi driver blocked our path after violently cutting us off. The driver got out and started walking towards us. My dad's instinctual words to me were, go, get out, go, which I took as my cue to execute a perfectly placed right hook, which rapidly de-escalated the situation. You taught me to be positive. Once you were mugged by knife at the dump site. Before that, you were mugged by a brick to the back of the head. You've been shot. You've had a pelvis shattered and held together with tungsten plates and screws. You had cancer. You had no blood. Through all of this, your answer to, how's it going, dad, would be the same. 100% boy, 100%. I haven't seen you in seven years and it'll be a lifetime until I once again do. We talked on the phone at length and regularly too. 
you love to end a phone call with a joke, which I presume all came from Ashley. And after our phone call, I was always better off. That's the last metaphor you have given me. To have known you, to have loved you and been loved by you, to have had you in my life, like a phone call from dad ending in a joke, I am better off. Rest in peace, old man. Wow, that was an awesome. Thank you, Dylan, for that tribute. And thank you, Justin, for that tribute. When I read a letter which um, Booms asked me to read, my rugby buddy, <laughs> we've become friends. As soon as the rugby game starts, you know, I get a, SM, a WhatsApp from Boom. Okay, we're going to do it now. We're not going to choke. <laughs> and we'll I'll have running commentary throughout the game from her. And of course, she would share her disagreement and upset. Um, we, we don't support the same local team, but we are poker fans. <laughs> and this is from, from Boom. My dearest Gary, I have to do this in English. Otherwise, if I do it in Afrikaans, you will think I'm cross with you. When we had a disagreement, I switched to Afrikaans, then you knew, knew no was the Engelsman in Moilekate. We met in 1998 at Noorduk. Your nickname for me was Boom from day one. You were the most stubborn, loving, caring, and bravest man I knew. Did not know how to say, can't do it. From 2015, when you fell and broke your pelvis during your cancer treatment, heart valve replacement, and not to mention the 311 units of blood you received, you never gave up hope. If people asked, asked you how you're feeling, your answer was always 100%. Thank you for having such an impact on my life, accepting Vivian, and Wayne as part of the parcel. You were so close to my grandchildren, their Gary, as Declan used to say, call you Gare. They loved you so much and will never forget you. We had so many plans ahead. Our dream of having a camper, visiting Stu and Dole's, but God decided otherwise. But that is okay. I know you're in a much better place now and without pain, but it is still so difficult to know that you're not on earth anymore. I will miss my morning coffee and your morning wife. Super is guarding me with his life, I'll be okay. The boys will look after me. The family is worried who will make the fed cooks. <laughs> A chili chutney and preserved guavas now. I suppose I will have to learn to make it. Rest in peace, my love. It was such a privilege to call you my husband. Until we meet again, boom. You know, I've just got a few acknowledgements which the family's asked me to read out as well. Firstly, the family wishes to express their sincere gratitude to all those who have supported us during this time of loss. Manny prepared to do the service for us. Shane for all your input and support you gave Justin, Kramer Funeral Homes for the arrangements, all persons involved until the paramedics arrived, God made ambulance service was so professional, 12 Rear Avenue was a regular customer. Vivian, for all your help in taking control of the whole situation, you were and still are my rock. Justin, I know it was extremely difficult for you, but you supported me and still are. Wayne, Pretoria, Stewart, Canada, and Dylan, USA, you are constantly on the phone checking on me. I also need to mention our daughters-in-law, Des, Susan, Tess, and Jean, for your constant love and support in this difficult time. To my baby sister, Eunice, what can I say, the support you gave me and spending the weekend during this difficult time, I could never thank you enough. You helped me through the most difficult time in my life. I love you so much. 
I want to especially thank the following doctors, Dr. Warren Muller, Dr. Emil Kutzier, Dr. Marius Langenhoven, Dr. Milan, Dr. Ruth Jeffrey, Dr. Weston C., who did everything in their power to help and sort out Gary's problems and assist where they could. The staff of St. George's Hospital always treated Gary with the utmost respect. They always welcomed him with the, are you back, Mr. Muller? All the visits, flowers, messages, people responsible for the snacks, and thank you, a, th a big thank you from the bottom of my heart. And last but not least, everyone that is here today, it proves that Gary had an impact on so many lives, and that makes me so proud to call him my husband. God bless you all from Boom. We have a special little item. I'm going to ask Josh Muller to come up now, accompanied by Shane Erasmus. Josh is going to do an item, Amazing Grace, and the immediate family are then invited to bring their flowers to Uncle Gary's remains. Well done, Josh. That was beautiful. I'm sure your granddad is proud of you. We've come to the end of a awesome um, remembrance and just beautiful stories um, that were told of Uncle Gary. And um, the family have just asked me to let you know that as soon as the service is done, you can make your way across the car park to the chapel towards the end of the, car, the parking um, for uh, light refreshments. I'm going to ask everybody just to stand as we close in prayer. And when I'm done closing in prayer, we're going to ask the family to exit. First, and as the family leaves, we can then follow on just to share our sympathies with them at the door. Father, we thank you for this awesome time that we've had together, thinking about the goodness, your goodness that you've shown us even through the life of the late Gary Craig Muller. This afternoon, oh God, we, we ask for a special anointing, a special a special amount of love to be released over his family as they say their final goodbyes in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you that you are God who never leaves us nor forsakes us, but you are there for us 
with the smallest and most silent of prayers, you are there for us in Jesus' mighty name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you, protect, sustain, and guard you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you with his favor and be gracious to you, surrounding you with loving kindness. The Lord lift up his face upon you with divine approval and give you peace, a tranquil heart, and life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We can ask the family to lead the way and they may cue the video at the back.